For the past seven decades, the UK's Queen Elizabeth II has reigned supreme. In the Queen's time, she had witnessed the world descend into war, seen the rise and the fall of empires, watched the rollout of the technological era, and endured the public turmoil and tragedy that befell her own family. On September 8, 2022, Queen Elizabeth II's reign ended, and upon her last breath, her eldest son, King Charles III's reign began. On September 9th, 10 days of national mourning started for the Queen, and her funeral is projected to be the most watched event in human history. And hey, listen, respectfully, respectfully RIP and all that. I'm not British, I'm American, and I'm a realist. So I'm here to tell you everything about King Charles III that the media won't. Because I assure you, even if you're not under the shadow of the crown, his rule will still affect you. And after you hear what I'm about to say, I want you to tell me something. Should this guy have the ability to shape policies across the world? Should he even be taken seriously? Here's what the media won't tell you about King Charles III. The eldest son of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, Charles Philip Arthur George, yeah, that's his full name, like four first names all in one breath. King Charles III was born on November 14th, 1948. Born later were his siblings, and this whole entire family, interestingly enough, is directly descended from Vlad the Impaler, the infamous Romanian ruler who used to put his enemies' heads on wooden spikes, whose name was actually Vlad Dracul, and whose character became inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. You know, Dracula being the blood-sucking vampire. Anyway, while he was a notorious playboy with many famous girlfriends in his youth, in 1981, Charles married Lady Diana Spencer. The couple had two sons, William and Harry, who were second and sixth in line to the throne. Though their true parentage has been a topic of speculation for decades amongst the front pages of tabloids. In the 1994 biography authorized by Charles himself, Charles revealed that he was pressured to marry Diana and he never loved her. According to his biography, Charles began having an affair with Camilla Parker Bowles in the mid-80s. The now queen consort Camilla had been married to British Army officer Andrew Parker Bowles, a very well-liked and well-respected fella. She'd been married to him since 1973 and she had two children with him. But Camilla and her husband didn't divorce until 1995, while Diana and Charles announced their separation in 1992 and divorce in 1996. So my whole point is that both Charles and Camilla cheated on their spouses. Really nice, really upstanding behavior. One year after their divorce, Princess Diana passed away in a car crash. In a recent docu-series about the late princess, it was revealed that in meetings with her legal advisor in 1995, Princess Diana told him that reliable sources had relayed that a car accident might be staged to kill her. And according to this legal advisor's notes, Diana said that she would, quote, either end up dead or be seriously injured, end quote. On top of what she told her advisor, Princess Diana penned a letter to her former butler 10 months before her fatal Paris car crash saying that she believed Prince Charles was planning a car accident that would leave her with, a, with serious head trauma. And this turn of events would allow Charles to marry Camilla. Her butler kept the note a secret until 2003, where he published it in his book, A Royal Duty, claiming that Diana had given it to him as an insurance policy of sorts. But speculation surrounding the death of his wife wasn't the only time Charles's character had been put into question. There's also this whole issue about his close group of friends, birds of a feather, if you will. Included in the list of potential godfathers for his son Harry was none other than Jimmy Savile, English TV and radio personality host of Jim'll Fix It. After Savile's death, hundreds of sexual abuse allegations were launched at him, transforming his reputation into one of Britain's most prolific sexual predators of the most heinous variety as he abused and preyed on children and adults alike. Charles was so close with Savile, in fact, that he asked him for advice over the appointment of a senior aide for him and Princess Diana. In and out of the palace on a regular basis, 
Saville's connection with Charles afforded him a key position in running the Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital, which Saville was appointed to in 1988 after having volunteered there for decades with the title Honorary Entertainment Officer. And this disgusting creature demon had his own sets of keys to multiple hospitals as well as living quarters at these hospitals. It was probably a really great arrangement for Saville. The girls he was abusing were in a mental hospital and it's not like anyone would listen to their pleas for help anyway. He also allegedly committed sexual acts on dead bodies and he even told several hospital workers that he made jewelry out of one man's glass eyeball. I think all children should be eaten at birth. That's for sure. How can you not know the character of someone you consider to be the godfather of your son? My mama always told me birds of a feather flock together, and rarely has that ever been disproven in my lifetime. Remember, on top of Saville being BFFs with Charles, he was appointed officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire in 1972. The Queen made him a Knight Bachelor for Charitable Services in 1990. And this made his official title, Sir Jimmy Savile. And he was even down with the papal knighthood, down with Pope John Paul II himself, as Savile also held the title of Knight Commander of the Pontifical Equestrian Order of St. Gregory the Great. Can we forgive one instance of being associated with court jester Jimmy Savile? No, we can't. No, me either, I can't forgive it, but I can point to an established pattern. The royal family is cozy, cozy, cozy with these abusers. We're talking friendship bracelets, braiding each other's hair, painting their nails, like Edward Heath, who served as prime minister of the UK from 1970 to 1974 and was a member of parliament for 51 years. This guy was investigated for alleged child sexual abuse and related homicides and claims of satanic ritual abuse. Listen, I don't want to get into it. We're talking like close to 50 allegations. Then we have the whole Lord Janner allegation spanning from the 1950s to 1980s, in which 30 child abuse victims spoke out against this parliament and House of Lords member, who was also president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, representing all of the British Jewish community. All of the aforementioned individuals were close to the crown. Very, very close, in fact, and if I may be so bold, were most likely the predecessors of the whole Epstein Island, Little St. James, Ghislaine Maxwell blackmail operation, which has been making headlines for the last few years. Speaking of which, that reminds me, we can't forget Charles's brother, Prince Andrew. It's like Epstein just continued Savile's extracurriculars for the royal family. According to The Guardian, quote, their friendship began when Prince Andrew was introduced to Epstein by Ghislaine Maxwell, Epstein's girlfriend at the time, end quote. Prince Andrew and Epstein partied together. They attended royal events together. Even after Epstein pled guilty to felony charges of soliciting a minor, Prince Andrew was still hanging out with him, and Epstein had a financial relationship with Andrew's ex-wife, Fergie. One of Epstein's victims claimed that she was trafficked by Epstein and forced to have sex with Prince Andrew. Since these accusations, Prince Andrew has stepped down from his public duties as prince. I just want everyone to remember here that the English king is the head of the Church of England. Historically, the English monarchy wanted separation and independence from Rome. Now, do you think the character of King Charles III embodies the values and principles of the Church of England? I mean, cheating on spouses, getting divorced, arranging the murder of your ex-wife, marrying your side piece who already has kids with another fella, and being besties with King Pedo himself? appointing perverts and pedos exclusively to run the government, with your brother having to step down from his royal duties because he, he was so embarrassingly and disgustingly blackmailed to hell and back by Epstein, by Jimmy Savile's successor? I mean, yeah, who wouldn't want this guy as their king and his side hoe as queen consort? They really seem like great leaders, especially for the Church of England, who wouldn't want to pay taxes to these folks. By the way, the monarchy cost the taxpayer $102.4 million between 2021 and 2022 alone. 
up 17% from the previous financial year. Way to go. Money well spent to one of the heads of one of the oldest crime syndicates in the world. They continue with this behavior because they believe they are beyond reproach from the common people. After all, how can justice truly ever claim them when they are justice? They are the law of the land. What are they gonna do, investigate themselves and find themselves guilty? And I know, I know, my American is showing. At one time we spit on the crown at the mere notion of a tax. And I think it's a practice we probably should have kept going, but clearly we didn't. And we all see how that's going for us. We've got the same justice problem here, clearly. And I'm just saying, ain't too late to bring back the tax outrage and rebellion. But alas, this roast must continue because I'm telling you everything the media won't. And the most important part is just ahead. Because I assure you, even if you're not under the shadow of the crown, his rule will still affect you. And after you hear what I'm about to say, I want you to tell me something. Should this guy have the ability to shape policies across the world? Should he even be taken seriously? Here's what the media won't tell you about King Charles III. So now we will bridge the gap between past and present, which I will adorn with this cute little picture of a Rothschild poking the chest of King Charles III like he owns him. And he probably does. We've all heard about the Great Reset by now. The World Economic Forum described the Great Reset as, quote, an economic recovery plan drawn up by the World Economic Forum in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, end quote. They've got those witchy one-liners like, you'll own nothing and be happy. The whole live in a pod, eat the bugs mantra. But the media has gaslit everyone who questioned it, calling them conspiracy theorists. But did you know that it was actually Charles's Twitter account who marked the launch of the Great Reset? They even had like a cute little graphic for his quote. As we move from the rescue to recovery from COVID-19, therefore, we have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. It is an opportunity we have never had before and may never have again. We must use all the leaders we have at our disposal, knowing that each and every one of us has a vital role to play." End quote. His Twitter account even tagged the World Economic Forum. Since 2020, Charles has regularly promoted the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum's globalist agenda. The Transnational Institute has referred to the WF's Great Reset as a silent global coup d'etat to capture world dominance. People like Charles promote these agendas through what they label as philanthropy and altruism. So just so we're clear, the Great Reset wasn't launched by Bill Gates or Klaus Schwab or Fauci or Stacey Abrams or whoever. It was launched by Charles, Prince of Wales at the time. Problem, reaction, solution, every single time. Problem, COVID pandemic and forced lockdown. Reaction, economic instability worldwide. Solution, the Great Reset. The Great Reset priorities include a fourth industrial revolution of automation, further merging technology and humanity, track, trace, and resolve for products on the blockchain, track and trace being a phrase that became popularized through lockdowns and surveillance of individuals to quote, stop the spread, furthering the go green initiatives, which sound fine on paper, but it takes a sinister tone in practice. The WEF's eight predictions of the world in 2030 published before any of this COVID stuff happened are as follows. And make no mistake, these are predictions, predictions, quote, air quote, because they intend to make them happen. Number one, you'll own nothing and be happy. Whatever you want, you'll rent and it'll be delivered by drone. You don't even have to leave your house. Number two, the US won't be the leading superpower. A handful of countries will dominate. So they will push for the fall of America. Our country will suffer, which you're seeing happen as we speak. Number three, you won't die waiting for an organ donor because there won't be organ transplants because they'll be printed. Subtext, what they're not saying is we'll probably have artificial wombs being commonplace by then too for our slave society. But if you want an organ, you better, <laughs> you better not be talking smack about the WF on Twitter or have a good social credit score or whatever. Anyway, number four, you'll eat, as, you'll eat much less meat because the WF says that meat farming isn't good for the environment and it's bad for our health. 
Number five, a billion people will be displaced by climate change. So there's gonna be a ton of refugees invading your country and your hometowns. By the way, just see how well that's going for Europe. Guarantee no refugees go to Israel. Number six, polluters will have to pay to emit carbon dioxide, eliminating fossil fuels. Number seven, you could be preparing to go to Mars, which is funny because we can't even go back to the moon if we even went in the first place. But don't worry, scientists will have worked out how to keep you healthy in space, even though all they do is poison us here on Earth through our food, water, and air. Then at the very end, the WF hints at aliens, which who I think, I mean, some of us might pay to abduct us at this point to escape this prison planet. Number eight, Western values will have been tested to a breaking point. Checks and balances that underpin our democracies must not be forgotten. It's giving diversity, it's giving cholergy. Am I allowed to say that on here? I'm not sure, but anyway, that concludes our predictions. So Charles has signed on to all these predictions and he's gonna make sure they're fulfilled. This old cuss marked the launch of it. Like I said at the beginning, the Queen's funeral is projected to be the most televised and watched event in all of human history. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like an opportunity to me from all the people who gave Jimmy Savile keys to the psychiatric children's hospitals. So be careful what you watch, what you listen to, what you believe, what you see. And as far as King Charles number three is concerned, what the media won't tell you is that he's not a good guy. He's not someone you want influencing global policy. He's not someone you want to be paying taxes to. Heck, I'd lock up my children if he were around. The company he keeps is a direct reflection of his character. And his side piece is the queen consort. Gross. Someone better start dumping tea into a harbor or something. Brits, it's your turn. We've already got enough to deal with over here. We wish there was tea in our water. It's undrinkable in like a dozen states at the moment. The more you research, the more you learn about these creatures, the more you reject whatever they're pushing, the less consent you give them, the less power they have. And that's what the media won't tell you about King Charles III. 